Uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks for, like you said, getting up at this ungodly hour. Uh, so my name's Thomas. Uh, you can find me, if you know me, it's my handle is FVT. Uh, I've been in this industry for quite a fair bit of time. Actually, it's more like 30 years now. And part of my career, I spend a lot of time in I, I don't spend a lot of time doing IR. I'm also very active in the community. I run B-Sides London, and I do a lot of work of the IWSA. Uh, what I try to do with my presentations is give you food for thought, all right? I don't necessarily give you a, I won't necessarily give you something out of the box, a solution or a thing like, I want you to kind of say, oh, well, yeah, this is a great idea, or oh, I could do something like this, or I could do, take this and think differently. One of the big problems that we have in our industry today is that we straight away go, where's the solution to help me fix this problem? And we start looking for new things. But we probably have a lot of things right under our hands that allow us to do what we want to do. And that's where I, that's where I come into this, these, this, these presentations. I'm, I'm trying to say, guys, stop, think. What do you have under your hands that actually can help you do what you would do? As part of that, I come into incident response and I'm, so I do some consulting time to time. I can help companies with their incident response, especially large ones. But you always end up at one point in time hitting shadow IT, right? And guess what? Most of the shadow IT stuff doesn't have the tool set that you have normally deployed in your organization. So you're hunting down these machines, and then suddenly you find one, and lo and behold, there's no bloody tools. So you kind of like, oh my god, what am I going to do? And you hit your head against the wall. Strangely enough, this looks exactly like one of my cats, but it's not my cat. <laughs> it's really weird. So as part of that, idea, I was like sitting there going, okay, so I need something that's going to be non-intrusive because I don't really want to destroy anything on the machine. I don't want to have to reboot the machine. I want to do it as quick and easy to use so and minimal cost. So I don't want to invest a lot of money into this. I just want some tool that's going to allow me to quickly do the work that I need to do, which in this case is basically draw some forensics details or find some evidence. And I was sitting there going, it's like... Well, if I can do this, I can use it for two things. I can do it to actually do investigations, or I can do it to do it dynamically to be able to do some hunting. So if I'm actually looking for something that I don't, that I haven't found, or that I'm looking for new things. And most of the time, you're faced with Windows boxes, right? Everybody agree? It's like a lot of times, it's usually a Windows box that you end up having to having to do IR on, if you do IR. There's one great thing in Windows, since Windows 7, PowerShell. A lot of people knock it, but PowerShell is extremely useful. And it's there, and it's there, it's part of the core OS, and you can't really get rid of it, which is really nice. So at least I know that PowerShell is going to be on those machines, so I could actually use PowerShell, and it's actually quite powerful, it's actually quite useful. PowerShell supports regex so i can do like really complex searches i can look for things based on a couple of characters or based on patterns it's got a lot of great built-in functionality so you can actually query the registry from powershell you can query wmi you can query anything that's part of the os which is really great you can list files you can query the event log and the other cool thing is it primarily works with objects as a data type. So when you pull out your data and you put it into a variable, you can have it as an object. So, so that means that you pulling, when you pull that information, you not only have the keyword that you're looking for, but you also have the related information. So like if you're pulling out something from AD, you might, you're, you might have the username, but you also have all the other AD attributes. If you're pulling file information, you get the file name, but you also get the full path, you also get version numbers, you also get uh, ACLs, you get everything that you really need. And so I'm, I'm going down this road, and I'm like, this would be really useful to actually pull out some data and pull out some evidence. But 
I ran into a problem. It's like, I don't want to modify the disk. And if you start to get complex scripts, you're going to write a script file, and you're sitting there going, oh, now I have to deploy a script. I don't want to do that, or I don't want to have to plug anything in or load a, load a, load a file share or anything like that. So I'm thinking, no, I can't use this. Then I, I pause a bit and, wait a minute, hackers, they don't use disks. They don't deploy things ahead of time. How do they do PowerShell? When, how do they use PowerShell to actually deploy the, the malware into memory? That simple command allows you to basically pull in a script. I'm sure a lot of you have already seen it if you've done any like malware hunting or anything like that lately because it's the most common thing that you do. But it allows you to pull in a script directly into memory and run that script directly into memory. So you can add functionality to PowerShell without even writing a file onto disk. Great. So I fixed my problem. I can now actually deploy stuff and I can start using PowerShell in a cool way. So, yes, I'm a success kid. Yay. So we got an awesome start, right? I can find things. I've got the registry. I've got the event log. I've got the file system. It runs in memory. No disk changes. Generally available on Windows 7 and greater. And you can find lots of cool, useful scripts out there. If you do a lot of good, Google, uh, if you've got Google Foo. There is one, there are some kind of little quirks in that a lot of stuff, that you, a lot of the advanced stuff that you need to do only really runs starting PowerShell version 3. So if you really have just a basic PowerShell installation on the machine, version 1, you're going to be very limited in functionality. But in most cases, everybody's got up to version 3. <coughs> so I started looking for solutions that would allow me to do forensics. Now, uh, Jared Atkinson actually has a solution that does full friends is gathering. So he's got a module called Get Forensics. It'll pull off the alternate data streams. It'll uh, grab the event log. It does some prefetch files, recent file cache, and things like that. But it requires a DLL. So I'm sitting there going, well, if I have to load a DLL, I have to deploy it and all this. But Hold on a second. Didn't I just say I could actually deploy things straightly into memory? So I could potentially use this, right? I could use the same technique that I'm using to deploy the, the PowerShell script into memory to pull a DLL off a, off a central site and pull it into memory directly. That, but Power Forensics, that's not really what I wanted to do because I don't want, the idea was that I wanted something to start to initiate the investigation and reduce the number of boxes that I'm going to have to actually do forensics on. So I only really want something that's going to allow me to basically pull data from the, from the, from the box to understand if I need to go into a full forensics mode. So I have foundations, right? So I know there's stuff out there. I've got scripts. I can do hunting with PowerShell, I can do forensics with PowerShell, and I've got a lot of cool built-in functionality. So I have a, a, a trifactor that's going to allow me to actually do this. I'm like, cool. So what next? Well, I was thinking, what do I really need to do? Well, I need to find out what applications have run or what processes have run on the box, right, over time or beforehand. So I can, that would be my first initiate, initial grab at trying to understand what's going on on that box. This is where Shrum comes in. So Shrum is actually short for Windows System Resource Usage Monitor. Basically what it does is does diagnostics for Windows over time. It starts running as soon as you basically deploy Windows. There's a really good paper published by Yogesh Katari. Um, his, well, I think it was through his university and SANS, but it was published March 2015, and where he explains the forensics implications of SHRUM, starting Windows 8. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> so, it's available Windows 8 and above. Okay, so that rules out Windows 7. Okay, never mind. Um, I'm, more interest, I'm more interested in some of the m more recent OSs. That's cool. It monitors desktop and Windows applications, so it's actually part of the, it monitors what's happening in the UI, or when there's a UI involved. It monitors services, and it monitors network connections. And we have a historical database. 
So it's actually tracking things over time, and it keeps those things basically forever, unfortunately. Or well, fortunately. So this is basic, this is what we, Trump provides five things. Application usage, resource usages. So how much an application is using in terms of resources, the Windows push notifications that get sent out, the energy consumption of the machine, the network connectivity, the network data usage as well. So that's like the application, how much data, how much network activity has been doing. Unfortunately, it doesn't map IP, it doesn't grab IP addresses or ports, it doesn't do any specific network activity. Basically what it tracks is which interface was used, which network profile was used, how many bytes were uploaded and downloaded, and process, it processes consuming that data. It includes also the user ID. This is actually very, if you think about it, it's actually very useful because if somebody creates, if you plug into a Wi-Fi location, that creates a new pro network profile. So you can actually monitor where that user's been on, the net, on the, or which networks the user's been. And you can tell which user actually initiated that network connection. So this is actually quite useful, despite the fact that we don't have IP addresses. I can actually see who's been doing what on the network or who has created network interfaces. For applications, we're talking about the application performance. So we're talking about CPU cycles, context switches, IOs, number of um, flushes, so how many times the memory is dumped, user information, the, the SID of the user who launched the program. I like that one. Actually, that one was really good because when you're faced with a user and he goes, I didn't launch that program. I swear I didn't click on that link. Well, it kind of tells you you did. <laughs> But unfortunately, it doesn't give you memory, so you won't be able to do any memory forensics out of this. Okay, that's fine. If I need to do full-blown forensics, that's a different story. I just want to find out what's been running on the box. Application history is is also really interesting. So you can actually see this in the later latest process um, explorer uh, task managers in Windows 10. If you go to options show history of all processes, it gives you a list of all the processes that have run on that box, including those that are no longer on disk. So you actually get a list of, a list of applications, the ones that are currently running, and then you have grayed out applications. Those are the applications that ran once, but are no longer present on the machine. And that's really interesting information. So how does it work? Essentially, it uses a bunch of DLLs and has registry entries and gathers that information into registry. It then dumps that information onto, into a database file. Right, so we're going from a DLL, reading the information, dumping it into the registry, and then onto a database file. The registry is used for temporary storage and profile configuration, so the, what it, to accelerate and to not really skip a beat, it basically stores it, initially stores the data into, into the registry because it's faster and every 60 minutes there's a flushing, there's a flush, there's a flushing system that writes it out to disk. The, data, the database is extensible storage engine. I'm like, Ooh, this is interesting, because ESE is actually used by Windows Update, it's used by AD, it's used by Windows Search, and it's used by IE Cache. So actually manipulating, being able to manipulate this engine can become really useful because you can then expand your, your activities to other domains and read other data. The network data, so you have a bunch of tables with this, of course. It's a database, so you know tables. So you have, for example, the network data usage table. You'll see that you see there's an ID, a timestamp, so that's when this network activity happened. You see the app ID, the user ID, and the interface LUID. So interestingly enough, you need to pull some of the information from registry because all of these are basically indexes or, or references to other parts. Now, the app ID and the user ID are actually quite interesting because it, they map to a separate table in Shrum which has the information. 
application resource usage. You'll, you lo you'll notice that there's a lot of information there as well. Some of the interesting ones are how, how many uh, cycles it's been in the foreground, how many cycles it's been in the background, the, how many bytes have been written, how many bytes have been read. So a lot of good information. And we're back to this UID. Now, one of the things that got me initially is that the timestamp object actually has multiple formats. I was like, oh, come on, Microsoft, can't you decide on one thing? I was like, can we just have one standard format? So the date timestamp actually comes out either an, as an OLE object or a date timestamp or a standard epoch timestamp. I don't know why, just you have to deal with it. This is the Shrum database ID. Um, Basically, what it has is an index and an ID blob, and that ID blob maps out to different values. So if you have an ID type of zero, the blob is an application path. If you have the ID type of one, it's a service name. Um, if you have an ID three, it's a SID. Now, the interesting thing is that this actually, the index, they're not, they're not, they haven't optimized this. So essentially, Every time a process runs, it creates an, or every time a new version of the application runs, it creates an index entry. So when you actually look at this database, you find that you might find that there's like, like 10, 50 versions of the application in that, uh, in the index. The GUID is used extensively in here. So, you need to kind of understand how the SID works and how to get it out. As I said earlier, the, the timestamp format is, is UTC, but it's either OLE format, 64 bits, or file time format, which is also 64 bits. But if you don't know, you, you have to kind of play around when you're pulling out the data because it's really pain in the ass. That's all I got to say. I'm not going to go there. The, when you're doing the network data, you actually have to go back into the registry to actually pull out the information for the, because it's pointing to an interface LUID. The interface LUID is basically a pointer to a value in the registry. And that gives you things like um, where, where, what kind of interface type it is and things like that. So what's the forensics angle in this? Well, if you map user processes, you can determine who launched what and when. If you have network statistics, you can see how much consumption has been done and how much, how much network versus processy time has been used. You can track programs, find those deleted apps, which apps were on the box but aren't on the box anymore. And you can find out run times so of processes. So how long have they been on the, how long have they been running? Did they run once? Did they, have they been run multiple times? Things like that. There is also a database about energy usage. And my thought process, and I haven't gotten there yet because I have to find a box which actually has from it activated and ran some, when some kind of crypto mining solution has been there. But if you're, you know, crypto mining scripts, they're going to consume a lot of energy or a lot of CPU cycles, right? If, especially if you go, done a, if it's a drive by one on some website. So if we can track process usage and energy usage, maybe we can determine which processes have been affected by some kind of crypto mining attack, right? This is a thought process. I'm thinking, of, I'm trying to find ways of using this data, you know, building analytics on top of this data. The process, mapping the process runtimes is actually a lot more interested in Shrum. In, in most cases, when you do forensics, you kind of pull the prefetch files to understand which Files have run and what and when did they first when did they first run? The problem with that is it tells you the prefetch basically tells you when that application was first launched. It doesn't tell you how many times it was launched or how long it's run. With Shrum, you actually get points in time, so you're going to see that the application was ran, ran on day one, day two, day three, day four, and so you get all of these points in time, and you can actually build a proper timeline. So like this, instead of the un, a lot of unknown, you can actually pinpoint where the where when word when. Oh God! Sorry, I need to, I need to take a breath. <laughs> it was a long night. 
So you can say when, where WinWord, when and how long WinWord actually ran instead of the last eight starts or, the, or when it was run the first time with a prefetch. So the other useful trackables is you map processes with users, you map processes and network, network activity, could determine data exfiltration. If you see some unknown process doing a lot of network uploads, that could be interesting. General program usage investigation. Did the user actually click on this program? Cool. So we have the Shrum Dat, which is the database. Uh-oh, it's admin locked. Uh, Mark Baggett did some work on this a few years ago, and his idea was, well, I'm going to create a dump tool, extracts and generates an XLS. There's a library that's available called libesbdb that does EAC to CSV. The problem with these libraries is that they actually need you to create a shadow copy of the database or extract the database from the box because they don't handle the fact that it's, it's running and it's locked all the time. So this wasn't really good for me, right? Because I don't really want to have to manipulate anything. I just want to come in, deploy my, run my scripts and get the information that I need and maybe upload it to a sim or something like that or some kind of analytics tool. So I'm back to square, am I back to square one? I'm thinking, oh God, more problems, more problems, more headaches. I've got other things to do, but wait, we're running, in, we're running PowerShell, we can have PowerShell. So what can I do with PowerShell to, to help me do this? Well, PowerShell is actually quite neat because you can load .NET libraries and C libraries and DLLs. So the simple, Command add type path will allow you to basically load a DLL or load a library. There is, a, because the OS needs to access these ESC databases, Microsoft.NET version 4.0 actually has an interop ESC, ESC NT DL, uh, library. The good thing with this is it's actually deployed on every box because .NET 4.0 is usually deployed on every box that you encounter. It's, I mean, I've yet to see a box that doesn't have .NET 4.0. Cool, we have success. So now we have a library to access this data and we have PowerShell and we're pretty much sure that the information is gonna, the, data, the things that we need is gonna be there. Okay, this is a bit small. Um, I'm going to do a walkthrough quick. Let me see. Is that readable? Is that readable at the back? About now. Is that better? So, um, some cool things with PowerShell. So that first line, you'll notice that I'm actually just creating a variable with a path to the DLL, but you can use variables like this. So that basically tells PowerShell to go get the environment variable for system root. So I'm loading the DLL. This is the path to the Shrum database. The first thing I do is I add the, I add the, DL, I add the type, I add type path to the DLL. So I'm loading the library. And then I can start using .NET references in my PowerShell. So these hooks basically def tell <coughs> tell PowerShell to look at the .NET library to use the .NET information as uh, to, to proceed with these functions. So basically here what I'm doing is I'm setting a variable with a file type called file type that's a .NET in 32. This one, these lines actually, this, these lines allow me to get the database info and access the database. Again, the hooks basically tell PowerShell to go into the DLL library or the .NET library 
And finally, I have access to my database. I can then open, create a JET session, initialize the database, access, and I have a session with that database. And I can attach to, and attach to it. So then I can do simple things like get table names. Uh, I'll, I have a video for this in a bit, but it, so you get a list of tables. Pre Windows 10, you've got six tables. From Windows 10 onwards, you've got like eight, nine tables. If you can access the table, so you create a reference to that table, and then you can go in and get things like column info. So one of the things that's actually peculiar with the ESC database is that basically to access it, you're not accessing it like SQL. It's more of a uh, flat file type database where you get the column names and then you access the reference for each line by column name. So it's kind of a mix of SQL and uh, other types of databases, but the problem is, is that you can't actually say, you know, select column A, B, C from the table X, Y, Z. You basically have to go select column A, get the value, select column B, get the value, select column C, get the value, then next row. So it's a little bit convoluted and you get to have to do things like this because there's no data type. There, the, each column has a data type, so you need to read the column data type <coughs> and then you need to basically pull out the information and set it to the right format. So you see, for example, here, if I get a column type long, I'm retrieving an int32. If I get a co column type binary, I set it to string, long binary, set it to a string as well. So you can play around with these, these values. You've got a currency value, uh, you've got int16, you've got a date time value, things like that. So. So this is, so I'm going to launch PowerShell in admin mode. So PowerShell has a built-in ISE, which is nice. So you don't have to, if you want to play and test and do things like that, you can just basically load everything into, into an ISE. Let me skip ahead. Oops. What the hell? Oh. It does not want to play. <laughs> so the problem is I'm trying to get the controls to get for fast forward the video, and it's not going to happen. I'm just going to let the video run. So, in the ISC, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to load the same script that I should, the same code that I just showed you. And one of my scripts, which basically pulls out the rows from the tables. So, the first thing I do is basically load the DLL. Then I'm going to start accessing the database. So first I'm going to get the database information. Now there's some interesting 
quirks with this is basically if um, you get inf you get pieces of information like the DB type, so you can take you see that it's a database that allows you to determine if you've actually got a proper connection. You can tell the you can get the page size as well, which can be interesting if you need to manipulate a lot of heavy data, so you know how much memory is going to cost you. You get the file type as well. That's a reference one, so I'm assuming that means ESE database or something like that. There's not much documentation on this, it's a real pain. So next, I'm going to create a JET session to be able to access the database. You notice that there's a user session username password. Um, you actually don't need to fill these in because the, c the connection will actually take whatever account you're running under. So since I'm running under admin, I'll just use the admin account. So now I've done that. I've got a session. One of the reasons I love using the IC too is it's got an autocomplete that's really nice. So I can see the username if I want if I wanted to. All right, come on. So next I'm going to open the database. This is another peculiarity of, of these functions is when you're testing if you actually have a connection and it's valid connection, you get is invalid false, which is basically valid, right? Is invalid is false, so it's true. I don't know why. Why? I mean, why would you do this to yourself, right? I mean, who wrote these libraries? I mean, no, I just Microsoft. You gotta, you gotta love them and you gotta hate them. You know, it's like a marriage. So I've opened now. I just ran the open the database. So you notice well, once again references are like cryptic. So JetDB ID one. So that means I can open more than one and I get different IDs. Again, is invalid false. So yes, I have my connection and. The dollar connect basically has nothing in it because you don't really see, it doesn't really get, provide any information that's readable. So next, I can start to look at the table names. So you notice this is like a one-liner basically where I'm just referencing the DLL function get table names and passing the session and the database ID. So you see this is a Windows 10 box. We've got like, the, you've got 10 databases. The bottom one is the interesting one, the Shrum ID deep map table. That's where you're going to be able to get some, the references to the SIDs and to the paths and the services, things like that. To get, um, to actually get to a, to a table in that database and get the columns, you reference the table name. You notice the table name is, is a GUID. And you see you get a description of the table. You notice the jet columns. The only thing that's actually useful here is the name of the column. Then you get the jet column ID. Of course, these are cryptic. And I found out that in some cases, you have an ID that has two different formats of data in it, which was really interesting. Made for some interesting debugging because I couldn't figure out why I was trying to put a value into the field and I was, and I couldn't figure out why it wasn't actually being accepted as a string when it was supposed to be a string. But it wasn't a string. It was some kind of binary blob. That's the app, that's the app ID one. Well, that, no, that's the app network usage. This is the application usage. So that gives you an idea, so you can actually describe the database uh, tables through these functions, which is useful, because then you can see what you're looking for. And this is the Shrum DBID map table. This is my favorite one, because it only has four, three columns. It's easier to manipulate. <laughs> So 
What's up? Hopefully next. Come on. Sorry, this is a bit slow. It's supposed to be running faster. I don't know what's going on today. Now, this is one of the scripts that you can actually pull from from my GitHub. Basically, I'm creating a function, gets from data, data table rows, and I'm passing it a jet table, right? A reference to a jet table. So you've got all you've got all these. That's basically describing each column, then pulling the data, and then I'm going to put it into a PowerShell object. Now, this is, I've just selected the whole function and I run it, and that's equivalent to actually pulling it into directly into memory, right? So now I have that as a new function in PowerShell. So you, know, you notice with the autocomplete, it's basically telling me it's highlighting my new, my new function and what parameters I need. Now, I run this on different boxes. Pulling data from the database is actually slow. It can be extremely slow. On one of my machines, it takes, for some of the tables, it takes up to 10 minutes. So this isn't, this isn't like, uh, you're not going to get very much quick stuff out of this. It's more for long-term persistence and getting an analytics done. So I'm going to provide it with the table. So you see, I believe I'm pulling, yep. So this is the Shrum DBID. So this was a, this is a box that hasn't been running too long, so it's, doesn't have that many entries, it's still got a lot of entries. You notice that there's a lot of blobs with funny characters, as usually the uh, GUIDs. So now I'm going to put this into an object, well, a variable which becomes an object. Now, one thing that, so, if you follow me on Twitter, about three months ago, I was complaining that Microsoft needs to make up its mind on what string, string formats they're using. PowerShell actually natively uses UTF-16 as, as a string. And you notice the, the strings there are badly formatted because in my script, I was actually converting the strings into UTF-8. Because that's, number one, that's what it said in the little references that you get on the, on the ESC file formats. And so I was converting the string to UTF-8, which was making it look really bad, but it was actually being stored as a UTF-16. So these are the little quirks that are a pain in the butt. So what I'm doing here, so now I have it in a variable. What I'm doing there is I'm formatting as a table, and I've basically formatted the index ID, the type for that variable, and the actual blob. So you, you, there you see you've got the index IDs, and you've got the type. So type 2 is a service, and you see the service name. So uh, And then I can manipulate. And this is why I like this pow the PowerShell, is I can basically manipulate that data as an object so, or an array, so I can reference things around th that way. Just skip ahead. Those are my backup slides in case the video didn't work. So where am I building scripts? Because you're not going to keep doing those awful commands by hand or doing things like that. So I've actually got some scripts running. Um, it's a really slow process for me because I've got a lot of things. Plus, I had to, I had to move to Ireland in in August, so I don't have much time to dedicate to this. But I've gotten down to the point where I've got a script to connect to the database that opens the database, connect, creates a connection to it. There's one to pull the DBID map, and there's one to do the table rows, and there's one to get the table names. I was going to do a live demo, but I can't connect back to my box. So what's the the good about this is that we can start to look at automatic data processing. But I need to figure out how to better extract the GUID because I'm having trouble converting it. I need to pull the registry entries to re-reference some of the interface information. If you're remote and the box is remote, it implies that WinRM is running. 
on servers, that's really useful because WinRM actually does run on the latest versions of servers. servers. That's how they do most of their remote management. And I need to build the module as well. So a, mod a PowerShell module is essentially a library of scripts that you can load in at, at, with one file. So it create, takes all those functions and just loads them in. The problems that I have is you need to do privilege escalation. It's not really a problem, but it's still, you need to be an admin to run these commands. The PowerShell version does have an impact because there are some functions that are just not available in some of the earlier versions of PowerShell. Uh, on Windows servers, so diagnostics is running, but it's not running. <laughs> yes. You heard me right. So there is a ser diagnostic service that runs on Windows on Windows servers, but it doesn't exactly run the way that you'd expect it to run. So it doesn't create the shrum dat file in the same place. So I'm trying to figure out on the different server versions where that dat file is. And there's a lot of other possibilities as well. And then I did this talk in, at Securite, the first version of this, and one of the students pinged me back and goes, um, it doesn't work. I can't get any information out of this. I'm like, okay. The problem was about two years ago, Microsoft turned this feature off on the EU installs. And I think they've turned it off globally, right? Or something like that. But you can turn it back on. And why did they turn it off? Because of effing GDPR. <sighs> GDPR is the bane of my life. If, you, if any of you know me, you know I spent the last couple of years helping companies deal with GDPR, not from the compliance point of view, but from the actual IT point of view and IT security point of view. With teams coming to me, it's like, what are we supposed to do? We don't know. They've done this checklist and we're supposed to be able to do all this stuff, but we have absolutely nothing in place. It's like, yeah, you went to one of the big five, didn't you? Yeah. Never mind. <laughs> we'll go forward. So, to sum this up, what do we have? We have applications, usage, who launched what, what, when, where. We've got network activity. We can use, so we can use it to do user activity. We can find out what the user's been do doing. What? I want more. Yes, want more. These are some really useful one-liners. The first one pulls out a database of file hashes from the box. The second one will go and find a hash. It's one line. The third one, who's, who loves to do USB forensics? The third one pulls out every USB that's ever been connected to the, to the box. This is the power of PowerShell, right? A simple command, like that last one, allow, uh, PowerShell allows you to directly access the, the registry. So a simple command can be used to basically do an LS on the registry. That's really nice. So, we have a lot more things. This is getting a lot more interesting. I can find files, I can find hashes. We saw, if you were yesterday in Miriam's talk, you know that we can use PowerShell to search the event log, so find events. We can search for configuration information. So we've got a lot of good stuff in there. Essentially, I'm kind of like building a mini EDR tool, or OS query with PowerShell, if you think about it. Hey, why not? But the point being is that if I go back to my initial idea, is I don't want to deploy anything, I don't want to add anything, I don't have to. All I need to do is have, a, have some one-liners or a bunch of scripts, and I'm good. Well, I'm sorry for the little hiccups. It's early morning, and somebody decided we should drink gin last night. Um, <laughs> um. <laughs> Thank you, Cooper. It was really good gin, too. <laughs> Anyway, that's how you can reach me. I'll be here the rest of the day if I'm not asleep somewhere. Um, feel free to tell me I'm full of shit. I don't care. You're full of shit. Oh, yeah, I know. Uh, but I hope that I achieve my goal, which is to make you guys think a little bit differently and kind of think, wait, I need to stop and think if I don't have a solution under my hand already instead of having to buy into all the AI ML. No. Thank you. No. Uh, thank him. Any questions here in the room? Okay, I've got a question. Oh, there's a question there. Hi. 
I might have missed that a little, a little bit in the end, but you just told us about some great uh, forensic stuff without installing anything on the box, but it's turned off now. So, no, it, you can turn it back on. Yeah, but the, the idea of, is that you, you encounter a box and you want to know what the hell is this. Y yeah, so that, that's the downside of, of doing this in Europe, is that you won't get the information unless it's turned on. <laughs> um, so, so, okay, no, I, so, I understand. But the yes. US, it, I mean, the US installs, it's still active. No, no, okay, that, that's cool, but um, they turned it off because of GDPR, so it, it's Windows on a local database, on the local file system, keeping track of what you're doing. How the hell is that GDPR related? Thank Germany. There was a German court case on this. Look at it, like, I think it was actually pre-GDPR too, because it was part of the initial, you know, the... It, it's your own OS spying on you, really. Yeah, it's not GDPR related at all. But... They've done it in the perspective of, private, of GDP. They, the court case was pre-GDPR in Germany, but they realized with the upcoming GDPR that it implied GDPR. It's all explained. Uh, there's, there's a reference to it. Right. Um, I'll look it up. Look it up. They explain why they did this, why they turned it off. Part of it is GDPR related because you do have GUIs, you do have user IDs, so you can tell if a user's been running. Yeah, but GDPR is about processing user uh, information by a third party, not by your own your own stuff. I mean, if I want to process my own my own per private information. Oh, uh, sorry, I might have missed. I might have not said this, but it's you. This is the diagnostic service. Right. So when you start your machine, you know it says, "Do you?" Sometimes when you crash, and it says, "Do you want to send the information to Microsoft?" Oh yeah. That is that's what gets GDPR. sent. Oh, that's yes. that's what gets sent to to <laughs> now this get stuff gets sent to to Microsoft. Right, right. Sorry, I I might have not said <laughs> yeah, that. That makes sense now. Okay, thanks. does it make sense now? Yep. Yeah. It's early. Drink more coffee. Yeah. <laughs> uh, any further questions in the room? He'll be around. Uh, if you want to know about gin tonic mixing, he's also your man. Um, check that out too. Okay, thank you, Thomas. Thank you.